Hello and welcome to O is for Osprey. I am Dori Stoley here in Plymouth, Massachusetts, and I'm program manager for Goldenrod Foundation. I'm really excited to share my presentation with you. And before uh, I tell you a little bit about myself, I would really love to know a little bit about all of you who are watching. I know there are classes watching along with some individuals and why don't you use the chat feature and type in your grade if your class as well as what city and town you're from and if you're uh, from another country let us know what country. So type in the chat feature. <clears throat> I'm waiting for it to come up. A little bit of lag time. Freshman at Elgin High School in Elgin, Illinois. Welcome, welcome. Tenth grade in Elgin, Illinois. And you are the folks that inspire me because of putting on this teach-in, biodiversity teach-in. We've got Elgin Environmental Science. Way to go. All right, Illinois has got a good showing. Any other states? I see other groups online here. Uh, in the ninth and 11th grade in Elgin, Illinois. Way to go. All right, well, we've got a good showing from Illinois. Ah, Valerie, thank you. Valerie Stein, Edmonds, Washington. Retired librarian and earth lover, glad to hear that. <laughs> so welcome everyone. I'm really pleased that uh, you're all here. And uh, just a little bit of background about me. Um, I work for US Fish and Wildlife Service, a federal agency for 12 years as a wildlife biologist. And I now work for Goldenrod Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization in Plymouth, Massachusetts, dedicated to coastal conservation for both wildlife and for people. And through my career, I've had the opportunity to work with a variety of threatened and endangered species, including the marbled merlet, and Valerie may have heard of that in Washington. It's a bird that um, is um, in coastal areas and, and uh, rather uncommon, unfortunately. Uh, also the black-footed ferret out in Wyoming a mammal, obviously, and I worked on a reintroduction of those. So another opportunity to bring back uh, a species in decline, and this has been successful as well. Uh, also, Kemp's Ridley and Loggerhead sea turtles down uh, in Texas and in Virginia. And now, as you see on your screen, uh, I work with the piping plover. So today we're going to talk about a great conservation success story about a species that fortunately didn't get uh, didn't go into so much decline that it had to be added to our threatened and endangered species list. The, and of course, it's the osprey or fish hawk. And I'm going to tell you in this presentation how Goldenrod Foundation's volunteer corps called the Beach Ambassadors use the osprey and its story to motivate people to conserve our natural world. So uh, the beach ambassadors do this by running, one of the things we do is running uh, an osprey viewing station. And this has three major goals, our osprey viewing station. Uh, and uh, Mrs. W, that's a great question. How many osprey birds we have today? And worldwide, it's about half a million, 500,000. And I will talk a little bit more about the decline and comeback of the population. Uh, when we go to number three, which is sharing the story of osprey conservation success. But so our goals of running this osprey viewing station in the summer when the birds are nesting, number one is to cultivate a sense of wonder and emotional engagement with these amazing birds. And it helps to see them uh, live and in, in person to do that. The next thing we do is after uh, people become really interested, we teach about osprey life history and habitat requirements. And finally, we go on to sharing the story of osprey conservation success. 
And I want you to take a look at this girl in the photograph. This is Mia. When she started with us, she was in third, uh, going into third grade. And she volunteered for us throughout the summer. And she actually volunteered just on Tuesday during our uh, winter vacation week. We have an event called Summer and Winter where we make binoculars. You can see she's got toilet paper binoculars, which is fun, but it's also a good lesson in how to, um, how to focus your observation on one area. So we do that and then we watch the nesting osprey. Of course, it's winter, they're not really nesting, but I play videos and folks can do that. And we have a variety of other activities, um, nature discovery, we have an osprey egg replica and so forth. So we continue throughout the year although our main work is in the summer because that's when the birds are nesting. So the way that we cultivate this wonder and emotional attachment is really simple. We're set up in a, a local park. There's an osprey platform that has a nest on it, and we just invite people to come have a look and, and see them up close and personal. And what's very interesting is some people, especially the older folks, go, oh, I see them all the time. You know, I, I've got some they're nearby, I see them. And we invite them to look through the spotting scope. And suddenly they become involved with an individual which has its own personality. This is what they see, something like this. This is an adult osprey feeding some young. And uh, people will go, wow, this is amazing. I've never seen them like this. This is great because of having that, that up close and personal um, experience. Uh, and here we have, just to tell you what exactly you're looking at, this is uh, the female of our Nelson Park pair. She's been named Lady Priscilla, and her mate is Lord Hamilton. No, no, sorry, Lord Nelson. Uh, Lord Nelson um, and Lady Priscilla. And she's feeding two of her youngsters. Uh, so we keep this open throughout the summer, and so people can watch the whole event from the... Um, adults returning from South America where they spend the winter to them laying eggs, incubating for over a month, hatching out the chicks, feeding the young, and then when the young have their first flight. And I'm gonna share a video with you of the first flight. Deb, let me know how this looks. So um, after several weeks, the chicks begin to strengthen their muscles in preparation for flight. And they flap their wings like this. And um, in the beginning, they hold on with their talons so they won't go anywhere. They keep trying and trying. And then finally, they'll obtain lift. And sometimes they seem to be very surprised about it. And they'll go up in the air and come back down. And um, oh, there we go. <laughs> Look at those talons outstretched. It's really, not sure, it's, I think it's trying to lower itself now. Uh, it doesn't really know what it's doing. It wants to stop. How does it lower itself? There we go. It takes some practice to become an agile flyer. Um, the, the fledging occurs about 50 to 55 days uh, after they hatch. And that's the mom that's just come in. You can see, but look at her back. It's solid, whereas the young has an edging of white on their back. And there's other differences as well that I can talk about. Um, so after, you can see this bird has sort of flown, it's attained lift, but it hasn't really gone on a trip. Eventually it will actually fly away from the nest and come on back and it needs to uh, strengthen those muscles and practice quite a bit. Now I, I have to tell you that fledging is not necessarily an easy thing to do. I mean, think about it, flying for the first time. We, the beach ambassadors, were watching a nest not this one, but a nearby one on Long Beach. And our first year, this was 2014, and we actually saw the first flight of one of the birds. So the sibling had learned to fly and was flying away from the nest and back. And it would come back and sort of abuse its younger sibling, kind of uh, uh, peck at it a little bit and so forth and call. But that younger sibling just would not take its first flight. So. One day the parent was there and we could hear all sorts of osprey, high-pitched osprey cries as it tried to encourage it to fly. And as we watched, it rose up into the air and, and, and flew, but it, it crashed down almost immediately onto the ground, but it was behind some shrubs so we couldn't see it. 
but we did see the father call and he also went down, we assume right next to the young. And then after a moment or two, they both flew up and the young got back on the nest and uh, had done its first flight. So it had overcome that fear and trepidation and done it. So it's very interesting to watch when you're there, the drama is just extreme. So the parents will keep feeding their young even after they've hatched. And uh, although it will taper off the amount until migration, and then here in Plymouth, they'll leave at the end of August or the beginning of September. So, um, well, when people, hmm, so we also uh, encourage special events for the Osprey. So we celebrate them. So not only are we watching them at various times, and that's a lot of fun, we also have uh, several events. We welcome back the Osprey. So when they come back at the end of March, we're out there playing some games, showing people the Osprey, getting them excited about the oncoming season while they'll be able to watch many, many different things happening in the lives of the Osprey. When people watch the Osprey, you know, something uh, exciting like that, naturally they have questions, which leads to our second goal, teaching about the life history and habitat requirements of Osprey and by corollary other animals. So while we're teaching about the osprey, we encourage people to think about some of the other birds in the area and other animals so that they can apply what they've learned, the concepts, if not the particular facts of life, to these other species. For instance, we tell them that if osprey survive their first year, they're very long lived. Think about, oh, <laughs> Katie said, how old are the osprey when they have their first flight? They are uh, seven to eight weeks old. And we actually, we know when they've hatched. And so we schedule the week that they're supposed to fledge. We are out there every day uh, with our Osprey viewing station because otherwise we're out there once or twice a week. You know, it's all volunteer run, so you can't be there all the time. But we go out that week every day and try to share this with as many people as possible. So, uh, so they're flying by seven weeks of age, you know, and um, they don't breed until they're three to five years old. And like I said, if they survive their first year of life, they can live for quite a while. Now I want you to think to yourself, how many years do you think an osprey lives? Think about that. Well, I can tell you that the oldest osprey on record was 25 years and two months. So that's pretty long. And they, um, they return to the same nest year after year. The males return from South America first, and they'll start uh, refurbishing the nest, making it, uh, bringing in some sticks and so forth. A few days later, the female comes back. And the female, is, like you see in this picture, is actually bigger than the male, okay? And I'd like you to have perhaps your teacher spread out his or her arms, spread them out all the way wide, or Anyone in high school can do this too. Uh, anyone can do it, but the length, the, uh, the width of your arms, how far apart they are, if you're an adult, um, between five and six feet tall, <laughs> or a young adult, then that is the width of the osprey's wingspan. Okay, five to six feet. Now the, the females are gonna be more toward six feet and the males, which are smaller, toward five feet, they weigh from 2.3 pounds to four pounds. So not heavy at all. Of course, all birds have adaptations to make them light, such as hollow bones. So despite the fact that they fly all the way to South America and they feed on fish, they are very light. So when the male comes back from South America, he will do an impressive sky dance. And this is to show other males that he's back at the nest, defending the territory, and also to attract that female back, the same female, unless of course she dies or doesn't make it back, in which case another female will certainly come to that nest. So, and once they're, uh, once they're secured year after year, they come back to the same nest site from South America. So you'd think, right, that the osprey would be together over the winter, the pair, the male and the female, uh-uh. They take separate vacations in the winter, but they come back within a few days of one another. Now people say, oh, it's their mate, they're attracted to their mate. And certainly it's good to come back to a mate that you've had experience with, 
but really the big thing is the nest site. Um, in Plymouth, they come back at the end of March and they work as this female is. They'll bring back new sticks and so forth to their nest. And you saw that nest in the video, big, big, big uh, pile of sticks. Now, before I go on, I would like to ask um, if you've seen an osprey or osprey nest. So if you can just answer for your class or if you're an individual, um, a nest or an osprey, let me know. Both? Neither? <laughs> Valerie says yes, many, because she's in coastal Washington state where there are lots of osprey. Now, osprey have to nest within 12 miles of either fresh or salt water. Oh, Elgin, none. Oh, some in Elgin. Now, I looked up on a, a map that marks osprey nests all over the country, and I know there are some in Illinois, but I don't know if there's some near you. But it seems like that would be a very good field trip, or perhaps you can go on your own to look at this incredible nest and see the osprey. Now, they are found, amazingly enough, the osprey are found on every continent except Antarctica, but they're nesting in the northern hemisphere. They're wintering uh, in uh, uh, Central America, here the Caribbean, South America, mostly north of the equator, but some go south of the equator. And the, in migration, they can be found, you know, everywhere except, as I said, Antarctica. So um, let's get back to some more facts of the life history of the birds so you can understand a bit more about how conservation worked for them. <clears throat> So within a few weeks of return, um, the pair will mate and the female will lay two to four eggs that look like this, more or less, there's some variation. And she'll lay them at three day intervals, so they're not all laid at once. It takes a lot of energy to lay an egg, actually. Um, but she'll start incubating or sitting on the eggs to keep them warm when they are, um, when she lays the first one. And uh, incubation lasts 35 to 40 days. And uh, the female does most of it. So she's on that nest, just keeping those eggs warm if it's cold, shielding them from the sun if it's hot, to keep them just at the right temperature. And while she's doing this, she's getting hungry. So the male will come and bring her food. And if, she, if, he's not, if he doesn't come fast enough, she'll let him know with loud, piercing cries. Some of the males will incubate a little bit, <clears throat> just like people. They have different personalities, and so they have slightly different behaviors. Um, but if he does incubate, it's usually for short periods while the female goes and stretches her wings. Excuse me. So <clears throat> those, um, besides keeping the eggs warm or at the proper temperature, having the adult there also protects them from predators from something that might want to eat the eggs. Avian predators, uh, such as crows, crows really like them, they're a big deal. But also, what kind of mammal do you think would want to eat these eggs? What kind of mammal can climb well, is found all over the country, uh, has very agile um, fingers or uh, toes, um, and uh, could, could climb up there? Uh, it has a mask? Yes, a raccoon. So if you've ever seen a nest hole for the osprey, it has aluminum around the base to keep those raccoons off of it. Um, so about a little bit more about the nests. Um, we didn't know this years ago when there weren't a lot of osprey or a lot of bald eagles, but the osprey won't nest around the bald eagles. And do you know why? I bet some of you um, Elgin High School students know why. Well, I have to tell you that our national emblem, the bald eagle, is a kleptoparasite. What does that mean? A kleptoparasite is an animal or bird in this case that will steal its food from other birds. So it'll let the osprey do all the fishing and then it will fly up and try and steal the fish from the osprey. And sometimes the ospreys can get um, hurt in these fights. Also, the um, bald eagles might even come around to an osprey nest and take a chick from the nest, oh, and take it back to its own nest and feed its young. So 
in this battle of uh, for territory and so forth, the bald eagle generally wins. And so the osprey will move at least several miles away from the bald eagle. Ah, there we go. So uh, after um, 35 to 40 days, the eggs begin to hatch. Now, before incubation started, before the female had laid all the eggs, do you think they hatch at the same time? Nope. They'll hatch one after another. The youngest one can hatch four days after the oldest one. So that's called um, asynchronous hatching. And the age difference becomes very noticeable. So we go from the eggs to hatching to ah, the parent feeding the young. These young are actually a few weeks old. Um, but the mom will spend most of her time at the nest and the uh, male will bring in food and she rips off food and feeds it to her young. Um, and guess who gets the food first? Guess which chick gets food first? You're right. Yep, the biggest one gets the food first. So she will feed the biggest one. It's the noisiest. It's the biggest. She's feeding it. Then the second biggest one and so on down to the smallest one. And nature can sometimes seem really cruel because this is a sort of insurance against not having enough fish. So if there's not enough food for all, then the youngest and smallest one will die and then there'll be enough food for the other ones. And so they'll survive. <clears throat> she also needs to spend a lot of time at the nest because the biggest predator on the chicks is a great horned owl. And so she and the male are vigilant and protect their growing chicks from the great horned owls. The young grow very fast, crowding, um, crowding each other. In this picture, you see uh, in the back with the yellow eye is an adult, and the ones up front with the red eyes are the young. So it can get kind of crowded in there. Well, let me tell you some more basics about the osprey. Most notably, they're fish eaters. 99% of what they eat is fish. And so they are supremely well adapted to eat fish. Have a look at these talons. Wow. And look at the skin on their feet. It's got um, the skin on their feet has spicules or little rough spots so that they can grip the fish better. Uh, let me answer a question from the high school. How big do the eggs get? Um, I wish I had the replica. It's about this big. Oh, so about two inches long. Um, it's like a big, think about a big um, chicken egg. Like if you buy them from the grocery store and you buy the extra large, that's about the size of them. So pretty good size. So the osprey, they've got these great um, skin on their feet that'll hold the fish. They've got the talons to pierce them. And the way they go after them is they dive down. So they've also got incredibly dense plumage to keep the water out. And they have a nictitating membrane over their eye. Like snakes have and other birds. That's a clear membrane that they can see through, but which protects the eye from the force of the, as they hit the water. Now, in a lot of species, in most species, that eye, the nictitating membrane comes down from above as your eyelid does. But the osprey is plunging head first or feet first and its head going into the water and that membrane actually comes up. So the force of the water puts the membrane over the eye instead of opening it. So that's a great adaptation. Another cool thing that they can do, and they're the only raptor that can do this, they can swivel one of their talons around so that they have two talons up front and two talons in back, the better to um, hold on to their prey. Oh, and a couple other cool things. So. They have shoulders that are dislocatable so that they can just go into that water and then they click back in place. And they also have um, fleshy nostrils that they can close. And most birds don't have that. They can close their nostrils because they don't want to get water up their nose. That would not be very comfortable. So after they emerge from the water, they shift the fish around to keep it streamlined in the air. So they're holding it with one foot up front on the head, one foot behind. So that as it flies, there's less drag from the air. And then they take it um, over, they perch on a tree to eat it or a rock, or they take it back to their nest to feed. 
So along with the return of the osprey have come some really uh, interesting technologies, uh, including um, tracking where they go for migration. Migration, they go um, from, here's one, Belle. She was, she was um, tagged nearby where I am, close to where I am on Cape Cod. And then on her first trip in the red, you can see on her first trip, that red line shows her first migration south. She went over the ocean, crazy. That's difficult. She landed in the Caribbean and then she went south to um, South America. And each year as she did her southward migration, she learned about staying overland and she, it's much safer to be over the land. And she did that. Uh, so these technologies are really pretty exciting. So I want to tell you, get to the story now of how ospreys decline and how they have come back or become more common during my lifetime. Um, in my area, so it was about 50 years ago, a downhill trend started with the osprey and their populations plummeted. So in my area, in Massachusetts, the number became 10% of what it had been. So basically nine out of every 10 ospreys died or just didn't, uh, didn't reproduce. And so those populations got very low. And so relating this story is actually the third goal of the Beach Ambassadors. Because we rescued the osprey, we can do this with other animals. We can apply what we learned and how we did it to other animals. You can do this. The return of the osprey is really a story of my generation and of your grandparents' generation. It continues to this day with hard work by people, but your generation um, can use some of these lessons and apply them to, to species that are in trouble right now. And it's a story about people like you and me, concerned citizens, naturalists and bird lovers and scientists who saved this magnificent bird. Now briefly, let me just tell you about the decline. So in this pie chart, you see a big circle. Um, this is just representing my area. This happened in uh, all over the world, but particularly in the US uh, because, well, I'll tell you why. As you probably, some of you already know, but in, um, so in the 1840s in my region, there were 2000 uh, pairs pairs of osprey. And then due to things such as um, habitat degradation, um, their natural, they don't, their natural nesting site is not a pole with a platform on top. Their natural nesting site was, was dead trees and even boulders. And sometimes even on the ground, they would build their big nests if there weren't a lot of mammalian predators. But due to habitat loss and, um, due to shooting, because there were no laws against shooting them, and also collection of those beautiful eggs uh, for personal collection before there were laws against it. By even the 1940s, the population had dropped to 1,000, which in effect was half of what it had been. And uh, following that, in the 1970s, it had dropped to just a hundred. So one tenth of what it had been in the 1940s. Um, and that of course was due to DDT. DDT, let me read to you, T. DDT, let me read to you. Let me read to you from Wikipedia. It's a colorless, crystalline, tasteless, and almost odorless organochloride known for its insecticidal properties. So that's for all of you in high school chemistry. For you younger students, it was um, a chemical used to kill insects. And it killed insects that, were, that could spread disease, like mosquitoes. That was a big one. And here we have, this is during World War II. It was used to protect troops as well as refugees and citizens against insect-borne disease. And they actually sprayed this chemical right on people, like this little girl who's getting sprayed. Now, 
it was um it was it synthesized it was made by humans ddt it's not a natural chemical in 1874 was when it started that was discovered um by a swiss chemist named paul Hermann Müller, and he actually uh, got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. Um, after the war, World War II, when I said it was used um, to control uh, pests, insects, it they started using it as an agricultural insecticide. So if you're growing crops and the crops have bugs that are coming to eat them, DDT was sprayed on them. But a lot of DDT was sprayed. Planes would go by and spray out this DDT, and trucks would go around neighborhoods and the trucks would spray DDT over the kids riding their bikes in the streets to control insects. And housewives in commercials of the time, you'd see housewives spraying DDT all throughout their house. And they, of course, were wearing high heels back in the day. That was how the commercials were done. <laughs> but as we now know, besides being toxic to insects, DDT is toxic or dangerous, poisonous, to other animals, and it's persistent, meaning it doesn't go away in the environment, and it biomagnifies, becoming more concentrated in an animal as it moves up the food chain. All right, I'm going to take a closer look at what biomagnification is. It's really pretty simple. It's a big word for a simple concept. So if you have DDT in your environment, if you look at the bottom of this uh, food web, food chain, the bottom are the producers, which are phytoplankton and they're getting a little bit of DDT in their system but then you've got something like a shrimp and that's eating what a lot of phytoplankton so it's a first level consumer shrimp eating those phytoplankton and so it's getting more DDT it's becoming more concentrated and then as you go up a fish eats those shrimp a bigger fish eats the fish finally to your top predators they are because they've eaten so many fish, they've eaten so many fish, they've eaten so many shrimp, they've eaten so many phytoplankton, they get a lot of DDT in their system. And guess what? Guess who's up there, the top predator as well, besides the osprey, bald eagle, peregrine falcon, and humans. So th that DDT um, caused a pro reproductive problems, problems in egg laying. Sometimes the eggs would be laid and they'd have very thin eggshells, and when the adult sat down to incubate the mom, generally, um, it would break the egg. And sometimes it wouldn't even lay any eggs because it messed with their system so badly. Now scientists, so people who noticed this were bird lovers and naturalists, and then scientists um, carefully monitored the nest, and then they also tested it on mallard eggs, and they saw it happening in mallard eggs, and so they made, they made the very important scientific connection that DDT was causing these issues. So not only was there an observation, but there's a lot of science done on this. So we know what the pro problem was happening. We had this great decline of this magnificent bird. How, how, were, how was this bird saved? I got to tell you about a hero of mine, a heroine. This is Rachel Carson. Okay, Rachel Carson had worked for my agency, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. She was both a marine biologist and a writer and she'd written several books before she learned about the issue with DDT. Um, when scientists started reporting on this, she became very concerned, and she urged her colleagues to, to, to write more, to bring this out into the light, and her colleagues, co-workers, declined. So she ended up writing this book called Silent Spring. She spent four years researching this. She had to make sure that the science that she was reporting was good because she knew there would be a lot of um, pushback about this from the chemical companies who were earning a lot of money from selling DDT. And also DDT was doing some good things such as controlling malaria, which is a, a terrible disease. So she spent a lot of time researching this book, uh, published Silent Spring. She, um, and once it was published, there was fierce opposition from the chemical industry. For instance, um, a biochemist, Robert White Stevens, labeled her, and I'm reading now, a fanatic defender of the cult of the balance of nature. And then the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture reported in a, in a letter to former President Dwight D. Eisenhower, concluded that because she was unmarried, despite being physically attractive, she was probably a communist. 
Um, but she had some important um, allies in high places, such as President, then President John F. Kennedy. And he got a, uh, put a subcommittee to investigating this. And she testified before the subcommittee as well as before the Senate about the dangers of uh, DDT. And she also popularized it because she wrote this book among uh, the citizenry, among you know normal citizens like you and I, and they became very concerned. Well, to make a long story short, um, in 1972, the Environmental Protection Agency banned the use of DDT in our country. Unfortunately, Rachel Carson did not live to see this. Even here, as you see her in the top right uh, uh, image uh, testifying, she was suffering from breast cancer and she was very, very sick. And she actually has a wig on in this picture. And despite being sick and despite her pain, she was so um, dedicated to this that she went on to, um, to, to, to go into and testify and work really hard. And she left this great legacy because of her work. A lot of people attribute the comeback of the Osprey, the banning of DDT, uh, in large part to her work. And then the work also of people like you and I. Um, and I want to tell you that Valerie says if you, uh, that she read Silent Spring when she was 12. Wow, Valerie, that's impressive. That's young. So never too young to read Silent Spring. She thinks everyone should read it. Even though it's a book from back in the day and decades old, it still has lessons for everyone. So the banning of DDT had um, a huge effect on saving many birds that were, as we saw, the top of the food chain there. Bald eagles had numbers had declined tremendously, our national bird, as well as the peregrine falcon and the osprey. So just to show you how dramatic this uh, um, return, this increase was, I've got this graph here. On the bottom, you can see years and in increments. And it took a while for the population to come back, because remember I said that the osprey don't breed until they're three to five years of age. So you only had a few osprey, the 10%, had to get old enough to breed, and then they had to have their um, young, and they had to survive. And so, you know, it took a little while. Um, but it was very, it was very dramatic. Um, and a lot of, if you ask, particularly along the coast, like Valerie could probably ask her friends, her parents and grandparents, a lot of people noticed this comeback because they saw more birds year after year. Okay, so take a look at the uh, the green line. The green line's my entire region, okay, of southern New England and Long Island, and this was replicated all across the country. So, in um, let's see, in in the entire southern New England region, in 1975, there are only 107 breeding pairs, okay, and then uh, in 2010, at the top of that green line, 2010, 1,274. So that's a dramatic increase. That's a success. This is a success story. Not only was it due to the banning of DDT, but remember I said how habitat degradation, habitat loss was an issue? Well, people um, put up these nesting platforms, poles with platforms on tops for the birds to build their nests. Here in New England, now only five to six percent, five or six out of every hundred pairs, actually nest in a dead tree or on a boulder in a natural place. The rest are all nesting on these platforms, sometimes on buoys in the water, um, power poles, and so forth. So that was a big help, too. And Valerie has personally watched the comeback of the osprey in her region, too. Um, I've watched it over the years, and that's why it's, um, it's a good story that I like to tell, because I saw it, and I helped with this as well. When I was 12 or 13, I got to help put up an osprey platform. And here we show this, this map is of my region. This is um, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. And the crosshatch area. Oh, Katie, uh, goodbye to your class. Sorry you have to sign off. Um, feel free to contact me later if you want to learn more. And um, I'll be sending out some links that you can have a look at. Matter of fact, I should probably put those into the chat box right now, okay?
so you can have some links. Uh, let's see. There we go. For different Osprey organizations, if you'd like to learn more. Okay. Back to our screen. Oh, no, no, slides. Okay. Um, yeah, so you can see the crosshatch was where they were nesting in the 1940s, and then the solid line is where they're nesting now. And really, the take home message from this is that um, Osprey have spread in their range. Uh, as their numbers have come back, they're nesting in more areas because they're not allowed, people aren't allowed to shoot them anymore. They're not allowed to collect their eggs. They're putting up the platform for them and welcoming them really back in their, into their community. So um, I urge all of you to take this story to heart, the success story, and think about what you can do either for the osprey or for another species. What you need, what I think you need, <laughs> you may know better, but the first thing is some sort of emotional engagement, something you love to watch, or if you're a fisherman, something you love to fish, something uh, you're fascinated about, and go on to learn about it. But the third part is taking the story of osprey conservation and using it to, to go do some action of your own. Now you can get involved in osprey um, conservation by uh, putting up a platform. You can also go uh, find a nest in your area and be a citizen science and report about it on osprey watch. If you look um, to the right here, you could see uh, this map shows where osprey nests are, have been reported all over the U.S. and in other countries as well. And so that's something that, um, that you can take part in, uh, observing it on a weekly basis and then adding your notes. Um, but to, let's see. So that's, that's just one of the things you can do. You can be a citizen science and look at the monarch, butterfly, a variety of things. You can uh, find a project in your own community, uh, and 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 or you can be like the Elgin uh, students, Elgin High School students, who have were inspired by the loss of the passenger pigeon to put together this great national biodiversity teaching. It's such a thrill um, to to see that they have done this, and they're teaching students all over the country and all over the world because. They were inspired to do this. So thank you, students, for your part in this and for inspiring me to continue with my work. And I'd just like to show you my photo and video credits. I can't take um, any credit. Maybe there's one or two photos I've taken in here, but it's mostly other people's incredible photos and videos that I've used. And so I want to um, uh, appreciate all of them. I also want to tell you about uh, if you really like the Osprey photos and are interested in what's going on here in Plymouth, on Facebook, you can like Plymouth Osprey Watch. And I got a lot of my photos from them, and I love to go to their site and um, uh, have a look at those photos. I've used, of course, some references and resources, um, some scientific articles, um, and different uh, books as well, uh, Wikipedia, and other resources to do this presentation. Uh, I think maybe I'll leave it on that in case we have a look, but I welcome your questions now and thank you for listening. You're welcome, Elgin High School. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Well, I hope you go back and um, have a look at some of these websites if you're interested in the Osprey. Uh, Ospreywatch.org. That is um, the uh, worldwide uh, site to uh, monitor the Osprey. Um, I also have um, the website for Goldenrod uh, that I work for, and you can find out more about what we're doing on that website. And then for the radio tracking, um, ospreytracks.com. Also, there's a question. If the eagles are here, the osprey will likely not return to here. Well, they won't nest really close to the bald eagle. So, you know, um, not within a couple miles anyway, but 
if you in areas where there aren't bald eagle nesting you'll get osprey so it depends how close is that um i like one bald eagle nest or several because if it's one bald eagle nest then they can come back to the region just not close by i am going to type in my email address so if anyone would like to contact me about anything along this line. Oh, do eagles take over existing osprey nest sites? That's a good question, Valerie. I gave this presentation to a group of people and I hadn't read about it or even seen it, but one person had seen this nearby in Westport River where the osprey have come back. There's dozens and dozens of nests, but she saw a bald eagle pair really chase the osprey away from the nest they had built and they adopted it as their own and uh, added more sticks and laid their eggs in it. So I think that a lot of these conflicts will come um, will come back, we'll, we'll see them because, you know, in the past when we were observing, there were so few osprey and bald eagles that, you know, it wasn't an issue. There were so few, they weren't dense. And now we're really learning about their true characteristics. So you've got a lot of eagles in the area now and nesting, I presume, because they, oh, or, or they, um, here just in the winter time because there are certain areas where the bald eagles will get together in big groups and spend the winter um, and then they start nesting earlier than the osprey uh, in january they start nesting and they'll be incubating those eggs in the snow sometimes so i uh, also if you're interested i urge you to look at some nest cameras online there's osprey just uh, google osprey nest cam there's bald eagles there's hummingbirds there's all sorts of of birds that you can look at through the nest cameras and that's a really cool way of looking up close and personal to birds even if you don't have one nearby that you can go to uh, some for the winter and a nesting pair as well in, in um, eldon illinois yeah so don't look for an osprey nest real close to them and um where they fish as well like what their territory is they'll probably osprey don't want to be that close to them so, you know, bald eagles depends where their fish source is. That's, or not their fish, their food source. Um, for osprey, it would be their fish, fish source. Bald eagles have a more generalized diet. So, uh, and fish can be a big part of it. So you won't have them within a certain range. I don't know exactly what that range is. It depends on how many, how many birds there are and what the food source is like. Well, it's been a pleasure. and. Um, I'm happy to stay here till nine if you have questions, but if you need to sign off and get on to another class, that's fine too. I hope you all enjoyed it and I hope you will uh, listen to more of the presentations this afternoon. I can see a couple people are writing, I think. So I'll wait for that. Yeah, so what young people can do. Young people can do a lot. Um, and I hope to hear about what Eldon High School students are doing. Um, they may do a Skype presentation for a speaker series I run called Making Waves in Coastal Conservation, even though they're not coastal. Um, people on the coast, they're listening to them. It's just such an inspiring story that whatever that you do uh, on a small or large scale really has an effect. Okay, I think the questions are over. I don't see anyone typing anyway. I want you guys to keep up the good work. High school students can have such a big effect. Here um, in Massachusetts, our governance is a town meeting where representatives are elected and they go in and, and vote on bylaws and so forth. And if kids come in, students of any age come in and present, that bylaw is much more likely to be passed um, if, if it's on. Um, banning plastic bags um, one was to building a playground to those younger kids um, then there was something on um, 
banning uh, circuses with exotic animals. And that passed because it was a young person who did the presentation. All right, I see Valerie writing something. Uh, yeah, you're welcome, Valerie. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your comments as well. And um, keep supporting those Osprey out in Washington. Bye-bye.